is um, kind of how my website is set up and you can go in and, and click on all of these different project buttons and it will scroll out and show you, you know, all kinds of projects. Um, this is not going to be all that extensive today, but um, okay, for some reason, ah, good, let's see, yeah. So um, just to, you know, briefly talk a little bit about those types of um, projects, you know, we always, I have a, shoot a lot of uh, modern residential and um, interiors for architects and interior designers. Um, sometimes I shoot kind of unusual projects. This is a wine tasting room in, um, in Virginia. Um, this is the Capital One building. So as you can see, they're you know, all different types of things. This is historic restoration at the cathedral um, here in Washington. And then I always look for details. Um, any project that I shoot, you know, I'll try to find something that that kind of really brings out the character of the building. But before I go into, you know, kind of more images, since I was asked by Mike to talk about my career, I thought, well, maybe I should do a timeline because I have I realized, <laughs> OK, this has been 42 years. Um, in terms of me just being looking at architecture and photographing architecture. I graduated from GW with a, a BA in fine art, major concentration in photography. And while I was there, all I did was photograph architecture. I, you know, details and looking up at buildings. And I mean, and that was pretty much it. Um, and when once I was kind of graduating, I realized, okay, I need a job. And I didn't really know that much about architectural photography. I was literally just responding to it um, at a very kind of cognitive it's level in school. Much, but, you know, and, but I, I noticed there was a notice up on the board for an architectural firm, VVKR, and it's no longer in existence, but it, it, they were in Old Town, Alexandria. And they had kind of an unusual setup where they had their own in-house photography um, department. So I went to work there and it was actually the perfect thing for me because it really helped me understand what architects need um, from a marketing standpoint um, to kind of show their projects through photography. And after that, I worked with a photographer who was very uh, busy here in the 80s, Harlan Hambright. And I um, apprenticed with him. And one thing about, I don't know if you guys did this, if the other architectural photographers here did this, but I think apprenticing is a really important part of the kind of, you know, career path for an architectural photographer, at least as an assistant. I guess that's what I was. I was an assistant, but also very interested in learning the process. And then once Harlan decided he wanted to go to St. Simons Island, Georgia and, and live there, I purchased his business in 1990. And that was an asset sale. And in that sense, all I did was purchase receivables, equipment, and all of his film library. So, um, it, but no, no liabilities. So that, that was a good way to go. And then I was the sole proprietor for a decade from 1990 to 2000. And during that time, um, I had a few amazing assistants. One of them is Judy Davis and, um, and also Alan Russ. And they worked with me throughout that time. And you know, both of them became photographers. Judy worked with me first and she started photographing and you know just getting really good at what she was doing and in 2002 we decided to become partners and we were partners for 20 years and um we're still wonderful friends um alan russ was also um, an on-staff photographer but when covid hit we just really decided to simplify and become independent businesses so now instead of a partnership we've created a creative group it's called Studio HDP, and it's kind of, it's a consortium of sorts. Um, we are individual businesses, but we do have a website, and that is the website I was telling you about, studiohdp.com. All three of us are represented there, and it's just a really nice way to have a group 
that we can call upon if we need another person to shoot. You know, if we have really extensive project, we can um, work together. Or if we just have technical questions, if, you know, anything like that. Um, it's been really a wonderful thing the last couple of years. And then along with COVID, I also decided to branch out and start what I've coined my winter work because I'm not as busy in the winter and I'm doing a lot of fine art exploration and coming around full circle to my GW days um, and my fine art work there and I'll show you a little bit of that in a bit. So this is where I'm, some of this might feel really basic to half of you on this call. Um, so I'm not going to, I know it's um, kind of obvious, but I think for people who aren't as familiar with architectural photography, it's really important to talk about the phases of our photo shoots. Um, and it's in, it's probably similar to any, you know, portraits or, or um, any kind of commercial work has to have the similar um, kind of layout of how to get from A to Z and have a final body of work that you can hand to your client. And I think the most important part of that is scouting. Um, whenever anybody calls me and asks me to photograph a project for them, the first thing I say is, uh, okay, well, let's schedule a scout. Because I think it's really important to walk the site with the project architect or the principal of the firm. Um, and I just usually say, okay, start talking to me. You know, Talk to me about the project, talk to me about any uh, design concerns you, you may have or any challenges that you had with the um, project. And it just helps me be able to then photograph it in a way that communicates the design intent. That's kind of my, that's the most important thing for me is not to make photographs that are by Anise Hoaglander. It's more about photographing a project so that you're looking at it and you're looking at the design, you're looking at the, how the, you're thinking about how the architect actually designed the project. This is the final shot from the scouting shot. And you can kind of see the difference. You know, my camera angle height changed, pulled back a little bit. We simplified the shot. I always make sure that I'm, um, you know, figuring out with a site plan or a, I have a compass when I go on the scout so that I know the exact timing for each shot. And then I create a production schedule uh, before the actual shoot. And then it's always important if you are scouting, if there is special equipment that you need, like a bucket lift, <laughs> you know, like this particular house was on a very steep uh, grade. And when I was just, you know, down here on the grass right here, it just was looming and it was all compressed and I couldn't really see it. You know, so luckily the builder was still involved uh, with the project. And when we were photographing this and they wanted photographs too. So they were able to provide uh, the lift. And then I was able to photograph the project and have it look like this, you know, and as you can see the um, massing you know, separates and steps back uh, the way the architects uh, designed it. This was um, this was Thompson and Cook <clears throat> architects, and this actually was, it's not now, but it used to be um, Max Scherzer's house. So that was quite something to be in there for a few days. And then another, this is another um, scout where the site was very tight. And, you know, I had to figure out when I was scouting, I knew that I couldn't shoot this from the ground because, you know, the mass on the left was definitely distorting and, and it just wasn't going to work. Um, I do have, and I'll show you in a minute, but I have an 18 foot tripod that probably many of you have, or you have something similar. Um, but so this helped me determine that I needed that. And that because of all this transparency, I really wanted to uh, shoot this at dusk. And this is the final um, shot of that project. This is by um, Robert Gurney. I have a kind of credit list of all of these at, later on. 
this was um, Capital One. I think I showed that a little earlier, but this is a completely different perspective. And my client, David Hairsign, was saying, um, you know, I, I've seen this at dawn and it looks amazing and you have to shoot it that way. So of course, um, I had to figure out where he was driving and where he was seeing this. And then I, you know, here I am in the median between this very busy highway. So I definitely, um, I try not to get into dangerous situations, but it looked like I had enough room left and right with some bright orange cones that I didn't have to worry about getting hit. And actually I, I set this up and then my assistant at the time, Kate Wichlinski, um, stayed there and shot this for me while I went over to a um, building about a half mile away on a roof. <laughs> so she was the one who risked her life for much of it. I have to give her credit for that. And then I, I put this back in just to show you how different a building can look, depending on what you're trying to show, the types of lenses you're using. You know, I, this is a very telephoto lens in order to compress the space. And then this is the, the same building on site. Um, so it's really important to make sure you think about that. And, and you know, this particular building was supposed to be, and it is kind of a beacon. And that's why this shot was so important. So you really have to, you know, when you scout, think of all those things and talk to the architect and find out what they, how they thought about it when they designed the project. And then I think my least favorite place to be is in a bathroom, but I tend to photograph a lot of bathrooms. And, um, you know, it just can never fit tripods. I'm sitting on toilets, I'm in the tub, you know, all these things. Um, and this is a little octopus tripod that I set up on occasion. And um, I'm able to do a shot like this. This was a very small bathroom. This was for the Wall Street Journal. And, um, you know, they asked me, it was for accessibility. So this is for um, a wheelchair to come in and um, kind of, you know, be able to take showers and, and get in the tub and it was funny because they sent the styling objects in a box that we had to use we had to use these and then put them all back in the box and ship it back so it was kind of an interesting thing usually and I didn't talk about it too much and but I always ask my clients to be responsible for the scouting um, I mean the styling objects. So whatever we're going to use for styling, it's either there on site and we decide that when we're on the scout or my clients will bring in um, items to use. And then I guess this is, I think the last thing I, I wanted to talk about in terms of for scouting, you can tell I think scouting is really important. <laughs> um, just look for a unique point of view because like the image on the left is a nice image. It's, you know, shot at dusk. We've got streaming cars. I was asked to photograph these restaurants. It's kind of a row of four restaurants. They're small, one story, it's a lot of trees, kind of tough to do. And I always tell my assistants or anyone who's kind of working with me and wanting to learn about architectural photography is to stand at the site, look at the project, and then turn around and look at what's behind you. And more than, you know, more often than not, there might be a tree 10 yards back that you can use for framing. Or in this case, there was a hotel. And so I said to my client, is there any way we can get up in that hotel? I think this would be a much better shot um, if we can get some height. So we went in on the scout and we coordinated with the manager of the hotel and um, you know, I was able to kind of block out a room for, I needed a very specific time that I, and uh, they were very agreeable, let us do that. But I think the shot on the right is, is much more um, successful. And then, you know, I know you guys all know it too, but I, tripod, 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 and laptop. <laughs> you know, those are my two tools. I would say 95% of my work, my 98 is always done um, 
with a camera on a tripod tethered to a laptop. It's how I have to work. It's much more precise for me. Um, I can see it better. I can enlarge the images. I can, you know, make sure we're moving things that need to be moved that are in, in the image. So that's very important. Even on a lift, I take my laptop up there. Does anyone have any questions, Mike, or do you want me to just keep going? I, there haven't been any questions uh, in the chat yet, but I, I did have a couple questions. Um, you know, I, we were talking about scouting. Um, I'm curious, um, uh, how often is it, um, are you just scouting on your own um, versus um, is the architect actually coming along? Is the builder coming? Is the client coming along on the scouting uh, missions and and helping to to point out certain elements of the architecture that that you should be paying attention to things like that. Yeah, I usually scout with my client. So some either the project architect or the principal of the firm will come with me and and talk it through because it's I really need that. Like they've been working on the project for a year or two years. I'm kind of just landing, you know, there for an hour or so on a scout. And I have to kind of based on that information from that hour, figure out what we're gonna do. So if I have somebody with me who can walk me through the project, talk about the you know, design parameters or anything about the project or how they want to, sometimes I'll even ask for someone to send me if they have a description already for, um, the project description that they're going to use for design awards or if for a magazine, then I read that uh, ahead of time and then, you know, just get familiar with the project. And, and, uh, and one more question with the, with the scouting um, in terms of um, how do you, how do you determine what you're going to charge on the, for like a scouting fee? Um, you know, how does that change and how do you uh, handle getting pushback on um, charging for scouting days, things like that? I scout um, at a, an hourly rate. It's not expensive to scout. It's um, you know probably three hundred and seventy five dollars is kind of what it usually is if we do a scout for an hour. And then what I what I'll do, it just is kind of added into the invoice. Um, it's a separate line item, but it's not, it's not going to make or break an estimate, right? but it's so important to me to do that. And I do encourage sometimes if, um, if it's a bigger project, it then, you know, I certainly will charge more for it, but it basically it's, it's like $200 an hour plus the production of a um, scouting PDF. So if I need to be on site, if it's bigger, if it's more extensive, then it's just charged at an hourly rate. And then um, it's, you know, I don't think I've ever had anyone say, oh, I don't want to pay for scouting. I don't, because it's just, it's, and I explained to my clients that by doing that, we actually are, you know, I might be able to shoot a project in a day instead of two days if we scout because then I'm organized, I have everything, I know exactly what's gonna happen in terms of what time of day I need to be at each location, that sort of thing. So it's really, it's not a, it's not a frivolous expense at all, but I do keep it very reasonable. It's just to cover my time, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have a couple of questions um, uh, popped up in the chat here um, uh, from Judy. Um, she's uh, asking about the insurance requirements for um, gaining access to, uh, you know, like a nearby roof. Um, are the insurance requirements for any assistance that you work with? Um, is there also independent um, and responsible for being on the site? Can you maybe uh, discuss that a little bit? Okay, sure. Good question, Judy. Um, yeah, we I definitely have to have liability insurance. Um, and some clients make sure that I give it to them and others don't, but I do have a, a $3 million, you know, liability policy on me. And then I do ask my assistants 
to make sure that they have one for themselves. Because the thing about assisting, unless the assistant is your employee, that assistant is not covered under your policy. So you really want to make sure that they have their own business, they have their own insurance policy, and you have a copy of that. Um, and then, you know, in the case of going into a hotel, if if it's requested, I can I just call up my agent <clears throat> and just have her send a copy with the um, with that person's name on it, either the company or person. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. I know some assistants do not have that, but especially for me, because I I work with a lot of um, I you know photograph a lot of really high end residential work. Um, with a lot of beautiful, wonderful things inside that can get broken. God help me you know, that would ever happen. But I've heard horror stories of other photographers where it has happened. Um, so you, you definitely have to be covered. You have to have insurance. And um, uh, going back to being on roofs, um, Russell had a question about the the photo that you took um, from the hotel of the street corner. Um, did you uh, shoot that through a window or did you get on the rooftop for that? Okay. Um, so for that, the roof was too high. Um, this was down a couple floors down. And yes, I shot through a window. And so what we do is we take black um fabric i have kind of light absorbing velvet big pieces of black velvet and we tape it kind of like a you know like a hood the way we would when we shot with four by five cameras we all had hoods that we put over the camera it's just like a huge hood that goes that gets draped um, behind the camera so that there is no light around the camera and no reflections Excellent. And then um, and we'll we'll take one more uh, question here from C.K. Hipkins um, from uh, referring to the photo that you took of Capital One from the highway median strip. Um, so did, did did that location for the camera, did that have to be uh, permitted um, or did you just set up shop on the roadway there? Um, uh, and, so and I kind of. I, t oh, I don't know if this is good to say or not, but I tend to try to do things without getting a lot of attention for doing it and then if i do get attention i'll deal with it later i have to say <laughs> i have been kicked off garages and and uh like around tyson's corner sometimes um but i i, I don't get permission for that sort of thing and I, you know what i've been doing this for a long time and i have to say that it works most of the time there are times where um if we have to get up into you know building or on a roof obviously i um, get permission it used to be before like way back in the day before 9 11 i could i felt like i was yoda and i would just go into you know the kind of lobby of a building and just t look at the guard and say i need to get on your roof and just look at them like that. And they would say, okay. And then I would just go up on the roof. That doesn't happen anymore, but I was really good at that. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It's, I know that sometimes things like that is, I know it's dangerous. I know it's, but you know, I, I, you wouldn't believe where I have been <laughs> to get a photograph. So that one didn't feel that bad to me. Yeah, like, and sometimes we always tread the, uh, you know, asking for uh, forgiveness instead of permission. Exactly. Uh, sure. <laughs> I do that as much then, as I can get away with it. Yeah, there's a, a couple more questions, but I think we can we can get to those um, uh, at, a, at a later point in the presentation. So we'll okay. yeah, but people can okay. continue to put their questions in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, okay, so here's another basic question, but I think it's important to talk about this because you know, the whole idea is you are being hired by an architect, an interior designer, a developer, because they need to use images for marketing. So it's really important that you study, you know, how they use imagery on their Instagram, on their website, um, any magazine articles that you've seen, because you want to communicate in a way that is useful for them. And, um, 
I think for most architects, the best way for them to communicate their projects is through publication. Um, that and and um, design awards, and I'm which I'll get to in a minute. But I think most publications, a lot of them publish the award-winning designs that um, architects win, you know, like Home and Design, Architecture DC, Architectural Record, all of these mag magazines um, publish um, award-winning projects as well as features. But so you kind of want to, you, you have to do your homework and you got to know what people need. Um, you know, I, the thing I make sure to do for any of my um, covers is like I when I'm on a shoot, I I always when well well okay so when I scout, I do ask the client, are you interested in getting this published? And most of the time they say yes, and then I'll ask what types of magazines they're interested in, and that way when I'm on the shoot, I know what the magazine cover design usually looks like. So I always make sure to find images that will fit. I don't literally take the banner on the shoot, but I kind of have in my mind, okay, well, this could be a really good uh, cover shot. So I always try to find that on every project that we shoot. This is Architecture DC. That, um, and then the other thing that is, uh, you know, other third parties. So one one thing we haven't talked about, and it's a whole nother discussion, but copyright. So I do, I retain my copyright for everything that I shoot. So that, and my clients know that, and they also know that if a uh, third party like the Windsor Windows or real estate or kitchen appliances, you know, if if they see the images and they come to me and ask if I can sell them, I have a stock um, photo fee for that. Um, but the thing I always tell my clients, and I think this is really important, I always ask them, my primary client, if it's okay to release. I never release something without their um, permission. So I'm not, you know, they're my copyright, but I respect um, my clients first. Um, I'm not work for hire. I've never done that ever. Um, but if someone asks me, hey, in this particular case, we really can't release these photographs, I won't release them. And I, and I just have to say no. But uh, in other cases, then I am able to just get, get some stock income from it. And it, in many ways, it helps my client because I don't have to charge them, you know, a, a kind of buyout fee, uh, which would make their expenses much higher. Um, I would, if I ever have had to do that, then I just double my professional fee. And then design awards, this probably fuels 50% of the work that I do, um, you know, I, maybe because I, I really am very careful about how I um, communicate the projects, but um, I tend to, to, you know, enjoy photographing for design awards. I, I really like that. And these are another, this is a house nearby, kind of in Northwest DC. Uh, this got published a lot by uh, McInturf Architects. Um, this one before, this is Bob Gurney. You'll see um, some other things of his. And then Studio 27 Architecture does, they design houses and, um, you know, commercial work. So I, I shoot a lot of, of their projects as well. And uh, Anise, can I can I ask um, real quickly? We, you know, I know oftentimes, you know, you're, you're being hired by by the architect or by the builder or perhaps uh, maybe even by the interior designer. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how uh, you uh, kind of work with uh, all three of those uh, types of clients? And um, you know. If, uh, let's say you work for the architect, the builder wants to use the images, um, you know, and, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. How do you navigate um, all of that? 
I always make sure that I have a primary client. And more, than, more often than not, it's the architect. Um, and then I will say the builder wants to buy into the, the shoot. Um, that's fine. And any help they can give us, you know, like when I needed the bucket list lift for that other shot, you know, any help they can give us is great. And if they have, I will I'll sometimes share the PDF of scouting shots with what is considered a third party. But the so the primary client has the say. And I always ask to not have too many cooks in the kitchen because it gets really complicated and I can't, I really can't be everything to all parties. Um, and a really good place, a good point about that for me is for the architect and the interior designer, if there are, um, you know, two parties really interested in the photography, it's a really different kind of photography. Architectural photography and interior design photography is just different. It's not, they don't really go together. So it's rare that I photograph um, a project for the architect and the interior designer together. I do for the builder, you know, the builder or um, trying to think of different third parties. Sometimes, maybe sometimes the kitchen, you know, if the house has been designed with a kitchen consultant, then they get to buy the kitchen photographs. And usually they're fine with that. And sometimes they even will come and style it. And that's fine. I'm fine with that. But I, I have to keep it, it gets too complicated. And landscape architects too, they get involved. And I'll say, that's fine but you need to use these photographs. You know, like if you want me to shoot specifically for landscape, I can come back another day and fill in, but um, let's look at what we get first from the architectural shoot. And, and you mentioned that um, sometimes say like the builder would uh, do a buy-in um, with the, if, when the architects hired you or vice versa, is that handled um, like as usage, um, are you uh, licensing well, rights so or are they actually buying in on the production? If if the uh, party agrees to buy in initially, then they just split the cost of the shoot. And then I add a um, what's called a third party fee to the shoot to, because it expands the use of the images. So then say I have a professional fee, a third party fee, all of the kind of line item expenses. If there are two parties who are interested, the um, builder and the architect, then they split it 50-50. If there are three parties, if the landscape architect is involved, they split it in thirds. And then everybody you know, gets use of all of the images. They might not all be useful to them, but it's a much uh, more economical way to go for these um, businesses if they are fine with that arrangement if they're not and they, like sometimes a builder will say oh I only need three shots you know and you guys architects they love 20 25 shots which is true like I, you know I'd photograph on a day probably typical day anywhere from 15 to 25 to sometimes 30 shots in a day if if I can um, builders don't really care about that so then I will talk to the primary client make sure that they're okay with me then just charging a, at that point, stock fee for the third party. And then I credit back some of that fee to my primary. So it's kind of complicated. Like it's like, I feel like the thing I think that I love about this business and what's kept me going for all these years is that every day is different <laughs> and every job is different. And I've never been bored my entire time. So, you know, it's a case by case basis, I guess. So, um, I guess at this point, is that, I'm sorry, was that it for the questions at this point? Oh. That, uh, well, that was great. There, um, there are some more questions, but we can we can get to those. Okay. Uh, well, let me just start showing a couple more. Sure. So, so um, these are the so I have these are some of my clients, not all and uh, by any stretch, 
but these are just clients that you'll see the next uh, images are from some of these projects that they've done. Um, most of the work I'm doing these days is modern residential or traditional residential interior design, multifamily and adaptive reuse and restoration. Um, this is a project by Bob Gurney, Robert Gurney. Um, you know, I would say I spent two or three days on site here. So what you're seeing here is probably just like half a day's worth, but um, we were there for quite a while. Um, it's all, always a mix of exteriors and interiors and um, elements, details. I love finding these shots. So it really kind of shows the types of building materials that are used. And this is the pool underneath. <clears throat> and here again, you know, I scouted this. So I knew I was going to have early morning sun coming into the pool. And I, so, you know, for me, that just kind of brightens this up and makes it more alive. So it, like after I scout, I definitely get a production schedule and I know exactly where I need to be um, on site. And then for many of the shots, I will shoot um, an exterior day and then a dusk um, because I think it's really important to show, especially with modern architecture, just the you know, the building materials and the transparency and, and the way it changes so much from a daytime shot, you know, to dusk. And these have been used in this particular case. I shot this for the architect and for the landscape architect. Um, and then the builder, I think, got some, uh, the window people contacted me, and this has won quite a few awards and um, international awards as well. And when we were there, when I was talking earlier about cover shots, you know, when I shot this image on the left, um, I kind of looked at Bob and said, this is a cover shot. And, you know, we just kind of laughed about it, but then RD picked it up. So, you know, I kind of make sure I find those whenever I can. This is a house in Bethany um, by Donald Lococo. And um, I just thought this was a really good kind of to show a, a daytime shot and, a, and one at night and just how different the, the building itself looks. And inside was just absolutely beautiful light streaming in. I was here for, I guess, two and a half days. I spent the night, two nights. We got there, we did a bunch of dusk shots. I shot all day the next day. And then um, I got up at dawn and I shot this on the last morning we were there. And, you know, the thing that's great when you can stay in the house, you know, I had to get up early, but at least I could sleep until right when I had to get up and I had the shot set up um, the night before so that, you know, we knew, I just had to hope that I was gonna get good sun, uh, good sunrise. Do I find dawn much more difficult to deal with than dusk. Um, and some people, some of my clients tease me and say, yeah, you don't like to get up early. It's not that, I just don't like the light at dawn for um, my photography. I don't know why I, I really, maybe I just have more control and can manipulate dusk better. I don't know, but we lucked out. I got a great shot and I actually, we were there on the solstice. So this is a, um, a house that faces directly east west. So I was able to shoot that one, that first shot and then move over here very quickly and get this shot, um, you know, exactly like in line with the sun. I was really excited. And I was hoping that someday this would be a cover shot and Annapolis Home picked it up. Anise, we do have a, a quick question from Cameron um, on these uh, shots here. He was just uh, wondering about uh, what are you doing to uh, lock down your tripod overnight um, to keep things in place? Um, uh, well, so I... Dirty yeah. on. I, sorry, I didn't do that. I just got it set up. Like I knew, and then my my tripod was over to the left and then I, I set it up that morning. Um, but I had, what I do is I tape the floor 
And so I, I'll have my, cause I didn't, we couldn't really leave this overnight because of just other circumstances. Um, but I had everything locked down and I put little triangles on the floor um, where my tripod tip was so that I could just go like this and put it back. And, um, you know, and then I just shot it with lights on before dawn. So I was up early. This is like four o'clock in the morning. I'm up there doing my thing. And I didn't even have an assistant because she had to leave the night before. But um, so I had everything, you know, made sure it was square, had everything set up. And then we turned the, I shot the interior with a little bit of light. And then we turned all the lights off and waited for dawn. Uh, well, I I do have a, another quick follow up on that. Um, uh, Cameron clarified. He's actually wondering about the the day shot and then the same position for the dusk shot. Um, uh, what, oh, what are you yes. what are you doing for for those types of uh, yeah, with the cameras? Just, uh, going, like, just sure. going back. Just you know, I just put I mark things with little little branches. <laughs> Make I always put little X's on the ground. And get, I just, you know, mark it so that I know where I was. And then, but this isn't identical. It's not exact. It's not, you couldn't, I don't think you could dissolve these and they wouldn't be exactly in the same spot, but it's close. It's definitely close. But I just mark everything. And I do that when I'm scout too. So sometimes I'll, and it's not always there when I come back, but I'll just go get sticks and make an X and then that X marks the spot or I'll do it on the day of the shoot and I'll run out, run around, kind of get all my um, shots. Like I know what time I have to be everywhere so that I'll just mark it before while I'm shooting interiors. I mean, that's another thing I do a lot of since I do shoot houses, um, I quite a bit. I will do a mix of exteriors and interiors during the day. So I have three camera setups and I, it, like at dusk, I always do three to four dusk shots. Um, so I'll have, you know, a camera inside, a camera outside, maybe I'll have another one on the second floor. So I'll have three, three things going at once so that we can get a lot done in a day. We run around like chickens with our heads cut off, frankly. That's, and I, you know, it's really, I feel like it's a marathon. Like I get there and then I shoot and I don't stop until it's dark. And that's just how my day goes. And that's it. But it's, you know, I kind of, there's a lot of adrenaline that occurs and it's fun and I like it. And I love all my clients. That's another thing I just, architects, are just the nicest people. And I've really, really enjoyed working with them. They're just great people. And they also are artistic because they're designing, you know, they understand what makes a good photograph. And most of the time I'm photographing something that is really well designed. So it's easy to make these photographs, I, I find. The, the design, and I people have asked me like, how do you, place your tripod and it's like I just let the design talk to me and tell me where it needs to be so and it has a lot to do with proportion and you know perspective and all of that and maybe I I don't know I it took me a while to get to that point certainly and, and I remember way in the beginning I would struggle and I would move my tripod left right front you know back and I would try to figure it out and sometimes I was like oh my god I, I can't get this the way I see it but I don't have that trouble anymore these days this is a fun project this is um <laughs> the Client's client said they wanted a hobbit house. So, you know, this is designed by Todd Ray. Um, he used to work at Studio 27 and now he's at Page. But he designed this uh, kind of house in a berm like this. And uh, you just, it's very protected and secluded and private as you come up to it. When you walk in the front door, it's kind of cave-like, you know, or tunnel-like. But then when you turn the corner, this is what you see. So it's just a really incredible project. 
and it's down in Southern Maryland on uh, the Potomac. And we were there, this was a day and a half shoot, but it was in the summer. So I had from, you know, dawn to dusk is like a 14 hour day. So we had, it was like a two day shoot, but day and a half. And this was another case where it's like, oh, I, I gotta get this shot. I know it's gonna be a cover. And it was, so Architecture DC did this. And then, you know, just quickly, I know we're running out of time. This is interior design. When I was saying it was a little different from architecture, you're really photographing furniture, wall coverings, you know, materials within and trying to communicate that through lighting and, and composition. So it's a, a very different type of photography. I'm not showing much of this today. Um, this is a, a project. Um, I actually photographed the house about 15 years ago and I just went back last year to photograph the pool house. And during that time, from the time I was there to the pool house, uh, this, my client's client, the, the people who own this house, they now live beside the Obamas. So when we showed up, when I showed up at the scout, um, I was told you may not point your camera over to the Obama's house or we will get kicked out. <laughs> so that, I thought that was really funny. So I made sure to only point uh, toward the pool house. These are some interiors. And then this is a little dusk shot of the house, of the pool house itself. And then, you know, the whole question about including people, as you probably noticed, I don't, I don't include people much at all. But sometimes my clients will ask me to, and um, we I'll put them in for scale. Um, I'm pretty adamant about keeping things pretty clean, but I will definitely do it. Um, I think we even put a little dog over here. <laughs> I don't normally do that, but you know it worked perfectly for this um, client, and they love having people in their shots, and I'm fine with that. Um, you know, this is another case where. This is an urban, you know, multifamily dwelling downtown on 11th Street. The people really help tell the story. This is a community space up on the roof. And it's just, you know, it kind of feels like a neighborhood. So I, I think it's really important. This is another one. This is like an adaptive reuse project, really interesting project uh, by Bonstra Harrison, where these were office buildings that were then um, redesigned and now I think there are how many like 435 units in these two buildings and this is community space down on the um, terrace so it's really nice nice design they did a great job it's won a lot of awards and this one was really fun too I loved photographing this because this instead of tearing down this building this is a kind of old municipal building um, in Arlington Studio 27 Architecture was asked to create a um, kind of annex to a high school that's over to the left side. And it was just such a fun place for high school students to be. And I, you know, I just really had a lot of fun photographing it. And here I definitely included people because you know, for any kind of educational facility, you have to include people to tell the story. So it's really important. And I, I certainly will do it when I think it's important and it adds to the image. Um, but I still like to shoot uh, more pure shots like this on the left where, you know, it's a nice dusk shot that shows the design. And then last but not least, I um, started doing some things for myself the last couple of years and I'm coining it winter work. Um, but I've been really interested in Kind of looking at organic materials and building materials from more of a structural abstract way. Um, I'm doing a lot of, of studio work with really small um, organic things like this scabiosa pod where I have to do image stacking of like about with 30 shots in order to get the maximum depth of field that I can you know because with macro you basically don't have any depth of field. This is another shot that I have of gra uh, grapefruit. And we've, I've got oyster mushrooms that I've been photographing quite a bit. I've been selling a lot of these. It's really interesting to me. But um, the other thing that's fascinating about the oyster mushrooms is that they are 
they're being developed and used for insulation and bricks in for building construction. So I, I just thought that was really fun and I love that way it ties back into my architectural photography. This is a detail. For some reason, it's been great, but people love these really big. So I, I just, I sold a print that was 40 by 60 inches of this shot, a little more uh, horizontal format. And it's hanging behind a, a couch in the living room. And it, it looks great. It's fascinating to me how um, much they change when I print them really big. And I'm traveling a lot more in the winter. Um, found some wonderful Spanish moss and live oaks in Louisiana and some cypress swamps details. And then I've gotten really enamored with the whole precisionist movement, which is in the 1920s and 30s when you know industrialization and modernization of buildings kind of started occurring. And, and so I'm trying to find images, um, creating images through um, building materials like this Corten steel. And then also looking at iconic uh, buildings and kind of uh, photographing them in detail and then um, kind of breaking them apart and creating um, abstract um, imagery. So I have a, I'm represented by gallery these days, Touchstone Gallery. So you can check me out there. And then I just put all my contact information here if anyone wants to email me or call me or talk to me. I'm all ears. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank and you. One o'clock. <laughs> yes. Oh, I just I, I know we're, we're going over a little bit, but if we, you know, we did have a couple questions okay. um, maybe we can get to from the uh from the chat real quickly. Um so Ben wanted to know um, you know, regarding the uh, 18 foot uh, tripod. Um, do you have any additional gear uh, between the camera and the tripod to uh, facilitate uh, changing your camera position when you've got a tripod fully extended like that? And um, and I'll add on to that um, gear wise. Um, do you use a? I know you said you bring a a, a compass, um, which in my head I thought of an old school compass. But are you you know are you utilizing any kind of apps or anything like that for um, you know sun position things like that you can recommend? Yes, I use. Um, it's just called Sunrise Sunset <laughs> and as an app. I use that. It has a compass um, in it, and it also tracks the sun in a 3D uh, kind of way, so I can look at a site and really figure out um, time of year, um, you know, when sunrise, sunset is, timing, that sort of thing. It's, it's really helpful to me. And in, in terms of the 18-foot tripod, I really just use it to set up. I shoot tethered still because I have used um, some remote, you know, I forget what it's called right now, but it can turn and manipulate, but I had trouble with that sometimes. Um, it, like it, it just cuts out if I, and, and I just decided to go back to kind of the more surefire way of just having a really long, tether cord um because that there's nothing worse than when you're when your equipment starts acting up right at dusk it's the most stressful thing ever <laughs> like you just you don't want that to happen i have had things happen like one time i was waiting 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 and my battery died and that was horrible but you know so little things like that but it doesn't happen often so it's okay and then uh, my, I use that tripod a lot. I use it quite a bit. Um, it's like my favorite tool for sure. Interesting. I don't have, and I don't shoot um, with a drone uh, mainly because all of my work is here in DC and, or, you know, within a, a certain uh, radius, you know, where you can, it's a no fly zone for most of all my projects. So I've just never gotten into that, but I do work with people who fly drones if I need it. Interesting. All right. And then um, we've got a, a question from uh, Mona. She's um, asking, as an emerging photographer, what is a fair rate to charge new clients for a scouting time, production time, editing, final delivery? Uh, that's kind of a complicated question, but can you maybe talk about your perspective of, um, you know, people who are just starting out and trying to determine what they should be charging versus a veteran photographer? And should there be a difference? 
Um, I do think there should be a difference. I think there needs to be, but I don't think, I think the the biggest, I, I've noticed that photographers who don't charge enough usually don't make it. So you have to decide for yourself what you need as a living wage. And you need to look at your own circumstance and know what kind of overhead you have and, you know, what kind of monthly income you need to make. Because if you're trying to do this full time, you know, you need to make a living. And then you just need to make sure that you're good enough so that you have clients come back to you because that's the key. You know, you can market constantly, but if you don't produce something that's worthwhile to your client, you're just not going to have uh, return business. And I think that for me has been the most important thing is that most of the clients that I have now, I've been working with for decades. So, you know, it's, so it, it's not, maybe I'm not answering I can't say you should charge $1,000 a day or $2,000 a day. You have to um, kind of look at where you are and do some research about other photographers who have been working for five years or 10 years or whatever, and you know, talk to them directly. Um, if you're assisting a photographer, talk to them because they're gonna know your situation a little bit better. I'm certainly willing, anyone who wants to email me and um, set up a time to talk, I'd certainly be happy to, but there's such a range. And I think what you tend to offer is very, very different um, per photographer. I, for me, you know, I do a lot of layering, incredible amount of layering. So most of my images are 15 layers and I'm masking and I'm compositing, I'm doing all this stuff. So my master file fee is gonna be maybe much higher than someone who is shooting for real estate and it's, um, you know, you're processing, you know, kind of single images and getting it out the door. So it's, I'm not trying to skirt it as much as I would say, don't undercut yourself. That's the worst thing you can do and you won't stay in business. Great, great answer. Great answer. And um, one of your clients, uh, I believe Studio 27, um, is asking, uh, when did you feel comfortable moving from film to digital? Oh, <laughs> and they they were there. Um, I felt comfortable moving to digital once the final image quality was similar to my 4 by 5 view camera. So, and it, it was a transitional time where you know, everything was so expensive and I was using a technical pan camera then with a medium format. I have switched to 35 millimeter now because, um, you know, I, I think I feel like the quality is is really good and it gives me a much um, kind of lighter load, but also more lenses. And, you know, I, I, I feel a little more um, uh, just easy, able to shoot a lot in one day. So if I'm, if I have 35 millimeter, but I didn't do that until 35 millimeter was good enough. So I kind of did everything in phases. And for a while, you know, I mean, I only shot four by five film for many, many, many years. And for about a year or two, I would shoot the four by five and my technical pan camera just so I had backup in case things weren't good enough. And that was really painful. <laughs> it was just slow. And I mean, Judy knows if she's still on here, we hemorrhaged money. Oh my God. Like one technical pan Arca Swiss camera with a two and a quarter back and, you know, three or four lenses was easily $40,000, $50,000. So we had to have, and because Judy and Alan and I were all in the same studio, we had to have three of those. And so we we worked much more slowly than we do now. I do know there are many photographers who still use uh, technical pan cameras like the Alpa and they're beautiful, beautiful cameras. But for what I'm doing, maybe it's because I'm shooting a lot of residential. I'm in much smaller spaces. The 35 millimeter camera just works better for me. And there's so many great cameras. I use Nikon and Canon and, um, and I, you know, I love them both for different reasons.
Interesting. And, and then um, Elizabeth Miller uh, is asking, how, how do you go about finding your clients? Um, well, I ha I've been doing this forever. So you're asking me at a stage of my life where I don't find my clients, they find me. Um, and that's, a I feel very, very fortunate to be in that um, situation at this point. But I will say over the years, you know, I made sure, so I'm a soft marketer. So I don't direct market anybody because most of the time, if you send postcards or you have a mailing campaign, my opinion, this is my opinion, it gets tossed in the trash can or, you know, it gets looked at, but it doesn't really, it's not kept unless it's really nice and innovative and you want to have, they want to put it on their um, desk. So the way I do things is I make sure that I go to events um, you know, like an AIA garden party, or they just had like, there was a, a casino night at the district architecture center. I go there and I'm, I just get to see my clients and I like them, you know, like I like hanging out with my clients. So we have fun together. And I think another way I think I've always marketed was I've, I've always made sure that on our shoots, I am calm and fun. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not as much fun sometimes, but I'm calm. And so, um, you know, I just, there's no real formula for it, but I do think getting to know people and um, I also give back to the community. I volunteer for um, the AIA all the time. I mean, I'm one of the um, members of CRAN, which is the Custom Residential Architecture Network. Um, I'm on the board for that. Um, I, I donate money to the AIA foundations. Um, I help with things. You know, if, if you do that and it shows that you're really interested in, in what you, you know, are doing for a living, it comes across. And, and then basically people just talk about you. And, you know, architects are a very close community. And, you know, they have lunch together and they talk about the photographers that they're having photograph their projects. So I kind of do that. And I, I guess one thing I'm not good at, and I you know, always know I need to be better. I'm horrible about Instagram. I'm just horrible. <laughs> so what I have rationalized is that I just let my clients, I ask that I be tagged at all times and credited. And that's that does marketing for me in a way. <laughs> right. And then um, I know we've gone way over. Um, so I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe there's uh, three more questions. We'll just maybe we can just very briefly uh, answer them. Um, uh, Cameron would like to know if you're uh, if you get asked to do video at all. Um, uh, Peggy is asking if you ever uh, uh, give workshops or do workshops. And um, and the final question is um, from Patrick, um, wondering if you ever get pushback from um, clients um, about using a 35 millimeter DSLR versus um, using one of the, the pan tilt cameras. Okay. Um, in terms of video, I don't shoot video. I don't think that way. So I, I just don't do it. So I have videographers who I know well, who I refer to my clients. And there are times when we'll shoot on the same day. It's kind of tough, but there are times when we do that. Um, and then what second question was. Oh, so, uh, do you uh, do you ever give uh, workshops? or well, host workshops? I used to do that a lot with Judy and Alan. We used to have a, um, it was called photographing spaces, um, but I'm not doing that right now. But doesn't mean I'm not going to ever, but I don't have time at the moment to do that. So no. And then are they, the clients um, paying attention to your gear? Do any of them say? Well, well, so nobody, I use a lot of tilt shift lenses. Um, I have every single one you can have. And, and so I, I, no one has ever s said anything about the quality. Um, because, I mean, you know, I do shoot on a tripod and I do a lot of layering. Um, I, there's a lot of post-production work. Um, so, you know, as of now, no, I haven't had that problem. Oh, good. I mean, they're all just different tools, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Okay. All right. Well, I, I want to say thank you so very much and, uh, you know, for, uh, well, for staying long enough to answer everybody's questions and sure. for giving us such a wonderful presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, the chat also full of many, many thanks from uh, everyone who attended. So, um, and thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm.